Whenever we talk about scientific careers, in my opinion, there's a huge amount of fakeness that's involved in what we present to the outside world about a career in science. So if you look at the university's prospectus, you see all of these scientists in their lab, nice and clean, going, ooh, yes, eureka, oh my god, this is good, and they're all smiling. That is probably the first lie. Another thing is if you speak to scientists, they have a pressure. They have this external pressure to be like, oh my god, I love exploring things about the world. I am on the forefront of discovery and this really is a career in curiosity. And I think for some people that is what they genuinely believe but I think that most people are just saying it because they are trapped in a system of research and science that relies on them sort of convincing themselves like a weird Stockholm syndrome that they love science and research. But a real career in science is full of stress, it's full of politics, it's full of ass kissing, it's full of being mean, and it's something that we do not talk about. So if you're considering a career in science, this video is for you because we're going to go through all of the different stages of getting a career in research and all of the things no one really wants to tell you. So the first step in getting a career in scientific research is an undergraduate degree. Close enough, undergrad. Okay, undergrad. At undergraduate, this is where you lay the foundations for your research career. You learn about the history of your subject, essentially. You learn how to do particular skills. You learn the knowledge required so that you can come up with your own ideas later. And look, don't get me wrong, undergraduate is such a cool, awesome time. I really enjoyed it because I love learning. But the thing is, is that undergraduate is so very, very different to a career in research. If you say you love science and you've only ever done undergraduate, what it means is you love learning about science. Maybe the act of science isn't something you really like, but you do have a little sort of like inkling and a little taster. Mwah a little taster of what it is like because quite often an undergraduate degree has a research sort of like project and you normally do a little tiny research project, you write it up, it feels very procedural, it's very likely not going to fail um, because it's been designed very well and that is your first taste of sort of like what research could be. But the universities try to make it very, very rewarding and very achievable because what they want you to do after undergraduate is to go on to postgraduate. Now, in postgrad, that's where you either do a master's or a PhD. Now, this is where, arguably, people really start to understand what a career in scientific research is about. It is no longer just about learning things, it's about applying that knowledge to a research project, a research question, trying to understand something about the world that wasn't understood before. But this is where it starts to get very, very stressful. The thing is, is that during a master's or a uh, PhD, you have to essentially work out stuff on your own and you'll get constant criticism back about what's going wrong, what you're not doing right, how you can improve stuff and that criticism will come at you from loads of different angles. But the thing about this stage of a career is that it's still relatively low stress compared to what is coming in the future because you've really got your research project, in my case, it was my PhD thesis, and um, this PhD thesis really was the culmination of just loads and loads of tiny experiments that were put together into a little kind of story structure. Oh, look at that schematic. I love that schematic. That's one of my favorites in my PhD. <laughs> I think during a PhD is where you start to get an inkling of the two things universities really bloody love. That is, lots of money and lots of peer-reviewed papers. There is a lot of pressure on PhD students at the moment to publish their research results because in a PhD, you are working under your supervisor and your supervisor is judged based on the amount of money they can bring into the university or the amount of peer-reviewed publications they can publish in journals. Those are the two things that you start to feel the pressure of weighing down on you and you're like, oh, oh, this is interesting, but here's the thing. So in a postdoc, this is where the true reality of a scientific career dawns on you because this is limbo. You haven't got a full-time academic position. You're not a researcher yet in your own right, but you've 
graduated with a PhD. So you're in this weird gray zone where it's like, hang on, am I a researcher? Well, you are a researcher, but in the eyes of the university, you're just kind of a bit of a cog in the machine at the moment. So this is the most crucial part of any scientific career, and that is the post PhD, and more importantly, the post five years after your PhD, and you need to work your ass off. You do that by getting the university the two things it loves, grants or papers. So if during your PhD you haven't been super successful in publishing in peer-reviewed papers, or that you haven't been very successful um, in showing that you can bring in money and sort of like start that career on your own, a postdoc is a perfect place for you to really hit the ground running. Now this is where I made the mistake. I thought a postdoc was like the natural progression to go on to something else, but it's not. This is a moment of high, high pressure in academic careers. You need to be applying for grants. You need to to be publishing as much as humanly possible and quite often that means gaming the system making sure that you're getting your name on papers um, that are published even if you're doing the smallest amount of work towards those papers you want your name on them and I have seen loads of scientific arguments revolve around making sure someone's name is on a peer-reviewed publication because that is what the universities absolutely love um, because it helps them bring in money in the future it shows that they're a respectable and industrial university with lots of research activity and that makes everyone very very happy and at this point a postdoc really is a place where you can get stuck forever you can be in limbo you're not there a PhD and you're not there an academic position you're just in the middle I know some people have been stuck in postdoc limbo for 15 years so during your postdoc if you're able to get a fellowship or a grant, like a large national grant, that is where you can start to barter with the universities to be like, I'll work for you and I'll bring my grant money to you. And trust me, they actually, I say trust me, but in the past, they used to really bend over backwards to give you what you wanted. But these days, they're starting to be a little bit more picky. And my, one of my friends actually sort of like found it quite hard to still play hardball. Despite he's got millions of dollars worth of funding, he found it really hard to play hardball with the university because they were still like, oh, no, that's right, we've got these conditions. So even getting loads of money and saying to the university, we're going to bring it your way, still doesn't necessarily guarantee. They're going to sort of like open the doors and openly welcome you and say, oh, or warmly welcome you and say, oh, welcome to our university. So... That is the next step. You need to get your own fellowship or your own large-scale grant funding because then the universities will start to notice you as an academic. Once again, if you can do those two things, bring in money and get lots of peer-reviewed papers, the university will start to love you. Come on in, mate. But at this point, we still don't have a permanent position in a university because you don't have a job as soon as this grant or this fellowship is over. So you still, after all these years, still don't have a permanent position. And this is where you need to convince the university that you are employable as an academic in your own right. And if you have jumped through all the right hoops, you've settled into the department well, this is where they may even consider just offering you a permanent position, but it's not guaranteed. I know loads of people that got to this stage where they've got their own money, they've got their own resources, they're starting to get PhD students to work under them, they've got their own master's students, and... They didn't get any more funding past their fellowship and therefore they are out of academia. I've seen it so often. So then the next stage is trying to convince the university to give you a job. So look how far we've gone to actually get a job and all of the stress we've had to go through. Undergraduate, postgraduate, postdoc, we've had to get our own money and our own grants and then we're considered worthy of having a job at a university. Now I'm not saying it should be easy, but surely, surely we should start trying to say to people, way be where's my pen, way before this, like how about, you know, maybe considering building up skills here that allow you to be valuable outside of university? Or maybe how about here, building up skills that make you valuable outside of university? The problem is, the further down this we get, the more trapped people feel. And so it's that sunk cost fallacy where they are just completely stuck. And then after a job, that is when sort of like arguably the real academics career begins because now it is all about getting money. It is all about continuing that success. So number six is do forever. 
do that forever. Apply for grants every year, multiple times a year. Apply for every grant you can get. Publish papers as often as possible, as many times a year as possible. Just get your name on peer-reviewed papers. Try to force your way onto peer-reviewed papers. That's what a lot of people do, it isn't ethical. But also just sort of like be as selfish as possible to make sure that you are seen as the person bringing in money and you are seen as someone who is very, very, um, industrious when it comes to making and producing peer-reviewed papers. You do that by getting people in underneath. So when you're at this stage, probably here and here, this is where you need to convince other people, undergraduates and postgrads, to start working for you. And then they will make your career better. Arguably, I would say that most of the work done in this area goes to the people who have got full-time jobs. They need you to produce papers so that their job and their position in academia, the prestige that they are able to suck up increases. And that is really what makes them more successful. So you have loads of people at this stage lying to people at this stage because they need to have a continuous flow of researchers coming in underneath them to make sure that they can progress in their own career. And then once you do this forever, you get like, I don't know, a tea room, tea room cake. <laughs> Mwah, delicious. If you like this video, go check out this one where I talk about the harsh realities of doing a PhD. I think you'll love it.